Hi everyone and welcome back to another Fantastic Friday video where we are talking about the Jesus Storybook Bible and the New City Catechism for Kids. And I was so excited for both parts of today's video. We're going to unpack some big ideas and some big stories and some big truths from God's Word. So I'm really excited to jump in with that with you guys today. If you're here for the New City Catechism for Kids, you're going to want to skip ahead just a little bit or not, stick around. Today's chapter from the Jesus Storybook Bible is going to be a good one too. So from the Jesus Storybook Bible, in last week's video, we talked about how the children approached Jesus. And the chapter kind of started where the disciples are arguing about who's going to be most important in the kingdom of heaven. And then it transitioned to them, you know, stopping the kids from approaching Jesus. But Jesus tells them, no, that they have to be childlike when they approach him, just like the kids are. And then Jesus tells them to let the children come to him. And those kids were so excited to approach Jesus. And God reminds us that we should feel that same excitement and that same joy when we get to spend time with God, whether it's in prayer or through his word. When we, when we know Jesus, we're excited. We're not worried about who's the most important or who's the smartest or who has the most things. We're just glad to spend time with him. And so that was a great chapter from last week. And so this week we're talking about friendship. Well, specifically we're talking about a man who didn't have any friends. And so that brings us to today's chapter. It's called The Man Who Didn't Have Friends. None. Sounds kind of sad. I wonder what's going to happen. It says, there once was a man who didn't have any friends. None. Do you have any friends? Well, of course you do. But not Zacchaeus. Poor Zacchaeus didn't have any. You're probably wondering why. Was it because he was so short? That's not a reason not to like someone. That couldn't be it. Was it because he had a name that was hard to say? Neither is that. That's not a good reason. Even though he was short and he did have a funny name, that wasn't it. No, people didn't like Zacchaeus because he stole their money. Zacchaeus collected taxes. Taxes were what people had to pay the king. But Zacchaeus took more than he was supposed to and kept the extra money for himself and made himself rich. Everyone knew what he was up to, and it made them cross and grumpy. They didn't like Zacchaeus one bit. So they made sure he knew it by doing things like avoiding him, and walking on the opposite side of the street, and pretending not to see him, and whispering things like, there's that nobody who thinks he's a somebody loud enough for him to hear. Anyway, one day, a huge crowd gathered by the road. Jesus was coming to their town and everyone wanted to see. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus too, but everyone was too tall. He tried jumping up and down, but that didn't work. He couldn't see a thing. Luckily, Zacchaeus had a good idea. I'll climb that sycamore tree, he said. So he did. He was surprisingly good at climbing trees for a man who was so unusually short that he had to take a flying leap just to get in his chair in the morning. And to turn the book. From the tree, Zacchaeus had the perfect view all the way down the road. Another minute and suddenly Jesus was at the tree. He stopped and looked up. Zacchaeus saw Jesus, and Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, Jesus said, I'd like to come over to your house. Zacchaeus almost fell out of the tree. Come over to his house? No one ever wanted to come anywhere near his house, let alone come inside it. The people saw this, and needless to say, it made them even crosser and grumpier than usual. They mumbled and murmured and muttered, why is Jesus being kind to that big sinner? Doesn't Jesus know about him? Zacchaeus scrambled down and took Jesus to his house. He was in a big hurry because he didn't want Jesus to change his mind. Perhaps Jesus hadn't heard about him. Perhaps Jesus didn't know how he had been stealing and how no one liked him and how he didn't have any friends. But Jesus knew. Jesus knew all about Zacchaeus and the stealing and everything. And he still loved him. Zacchaeus was ashamed. Lord, he said, turning pale, what I've done is wrong, but now I want to do the right thing. 
I will give the money back to everyone four times what I stole. And that's just what he did. Jesus smiled. My friend, he said, today God has rescued you. Jesus loved Zacchaeus when nobody else did. He was Zacchaeus' friend even when no one else was. Because Jesus was showing people what God's love was like. His wonderful, never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And that is the story of Zacchaeus. And so, again, this chapter just has so many wonderful truths. And even though it happened a long time ago, it's still perfectly relevant for today and for how we should treat other people. You guys know at the end of my videos, I always say to show the love of Jesus to whomever you meet. And this is what showing the love of Jesus looks like. It's loving people that maybe other people don't like or don't care for. Maybe it's people that you don't even care for yourself. But Jesus loves those people. He sees their value. And even though sometimes people do things that hurt us and that are wrong, God calls us to love them. Jesus loved those people. And that's the awesome thing about Jesus is that Jesus not only loves other people when they do things that hurt us, he loves us when we do those things too. Because we've all made mistakes. We've all sinned and we've done things that, that cause us to fall short from what God calls us to be. But God still loves us anyway. He has a never giving up, unfailing love. And that is such good news for us. So just like we should love people the way Jesus loves Zacchaeus, Jesus loves us that same way too. He loves us in a never giving up, unfailing kind of love. And that is good news. So that is it for today's chapter. Next week, we are going to be talking about running away. So we're going to talk about a man who runs away from home because he thinks that what he's going to find there is better but we're going to see what happens. And it's such a good story. And I hope you'll tune in for that. I also hope you'll stick around for today's question from the New City Catechism for kids. We've been talking about the Ten Commandments. And so in talking about how God calls us to live and how God calls us to love other people, what does that look like practically? And then even though the Ten Commandments are something that it's in the Old Testament, that um, it's still something that's completely relevant for us today and looking at what the whole Bible has to say about the commands that God gives his people. And so I hope you'll tune in for that. It's going to be a great time. If not, please be kind. Show the love of Jesus to your family, to your friends, to whomever you meet. I am praying for you always, and I miss you terribly, and I love you very much, and I cannot wait to talk to you again soon. Bye. Hi everyone and welcome to this week's video from the New City Catechism for Kids. If you stuck around from the Jesus Storybook Bible, thank you so much. And if you skipped ahead to this part of the video, welcome. I am so excited that you are here today. So we've been walking through the New City Catechism for Kids together and we've been looking at big questions and what the Bible has to say about those questions. So for the past several weeks, we've been talking about the Ten Commandments. And so last week we looked at question number 11 and question number 11 asks, what does the law of God require in the sixth, seventh, and eighth commandments? Did you memorize the answer? Go ahead. Shout out. I'm listening. Yeah, this one was a big one to unpack. And it says sixth, that we do not hurt or hate our neighbor. Seventh, that we live purely and faithfully. And eighth, that we do not take without permission that which belongs to someone else. And each of these commandments deal in some shape or form with how we treat our neighbor. For some of them, the phrasing reads differently here in the answer to the question than what it does in the Bible. But our interpretation of them is the same because that's ultimately what these questions are helping us do. Interpret what scripture says about different topics. So for commandment six, it tells us in the Bible to not murder. But here it reads as do not hurt or hate your neighbor. This is because Jesus tells us that if we hate someone, we've already murdered them in our hearts. And more than being called not to murder anyone, we're called to love them. We're called to pray for people who hurt us and who we don't care for. We're called to care for them well 
and love them the way that Jesus loves us because they're still people created in the image of God. And that means they have value and we should love them and treat them as such. And while commandment seven at first looks like it's mostly for us and has nothing to do with our neighbor, we talked about how sin doesn't affect just one person. Sin has a ripple effect that goes on to impact others. So while the context of commandment number seven is about adult relationships, especially between people who are married, it's also a call to live purely and faithfully in a way that's pleasing to God because ultimately our sin impacts more than just us. And we're called to live in a way that loves other people, but most of all loves and honors the God who created us. And then finally, we address commandment number eight. And while we read it as not stealing something, we can also look at commandment number eight as a call to be generous with the things that God has given us. God has given us much, and we should use those good gifts to love others well and to bring him glory. So again, the first three commandments were all about worshiping God and God alone for who he is and what he's done. Then we moved on and looked at specific ways that we could love God and bring him glory by keeping the Sabbath and honoring our parents. And then finally, as we just saw, we looked at how we should treat our neighbor. So today we're wrapping up our breakdown of the Ten Commandments by looking at commandments 9 and 10. So what does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? Do you know? If you know, shout it out. I'm listening. Go ahead. Those are good tries. So we answer that question this way. What does God require in the ninth and 10th commandments? It's ninth that we do not lie or deceive, and 10th, that we are content, not envying anyone. Now, at face value, these commands seem kind of easy and basic. Don't lie and don't want what belongs to someone else. Easy peasy mac and cheesy, right? And partially, that's true. But there's a lot more that goes along with these two commandments as well. Both of these commandments are about loving our neighbor, but they're also about setting boundaries and having control of our actions. So last week, as we talked about, love is the fulfillment of the law. Loving our neighbor is how we keep the commandments and how we should interpret the commands of God. They're helping us bring God glory and to love our neighbor well. But the Bible has specific things to say about each of these commandments and why they're not only for the good of our neighbor, but for our good as well. So first, let's talk about commandment number nine. Commandment number nine, as we read it here, tells us not to lie or deceive. The book of Exodus, where the Ten Commandments are recorded, phrases it similarly. It tells us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. So in Exodus, we're specifically directed not to lie against our neighbor. But why? I remember when I was a kid, there was a movie that I loved, and it compared lying to a weed. And what do weeds tend to do? They spread, especially if you don't pull them out by the root. They just pop up again if you don't handle them. Lying about people or situations is like that. Lies can grow and spread and get out of control and ultimately hurt other people and do damage that you didn't intend. But our answer today also adds the word deceive. We can get behind needing to tell the truth. And we understand, at least on a certain level, why lying is wrong. But what does it mean to deceive? To deceive someone means to intentionally cause someone to believe something that isn't true, often for your own personal advantage. So sometimes we think that just because we don't say something that's untrue, then we're good. We've kept the commandment. We can check it off the list. But what we see from Scripture is that deception also falls in, under this category. If we leave out information or we lead someone to think or believe something that we know for sure isn't true, the Bible tells us that this is the same as, as lying to them. And it shouldn't be that way. The book of James talks to us about controlling our mouths. Now, the book of James is a New Testament book, and it was written by James, the brother of Jesus. And James talks a lot about our actions, and again, about controlling our mouths. Because if you think about it, our mouths and what we say often have the power to do the most damage. Whether it's something we say or something we write without thinking, or even something that we say or do intentionally to hurt someone else, our words are powerful. And that's what James calls our attention to in chapter three of his book. And it's what this 
commandment, commandment nine, calls our attention to as well. So if you don't have it already, I want you to pause the video, run, grab your Bible. I'll wait here. No worries. And then we're going to be in the book of James. So that's going to be in the New Testament, and it's going to be towards the back. Okay, sorry, there's a insert in mine. Okay, so it's going to be towards the back, almost at the end of your Bible. So we're going to be in the book of James, chapter 3, and we're going to look at two sets of verses. They're still going to be in the same chapter. I'm just going to ask you to skip ahead with me a little bit. So are you ready? Awesome. Let's go. We're going to be in chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 7. All right. And it says this, For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And now we're going to skip and we're going to look at verses 16 through 18. So picking up in verse 16, it says this. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So what James is telling us here is that the tongue can't be tamed. It's full of evil, he says. With it, we praise God and then curse and insult and hurt other people who are made in the image of God. And it shouldn't be so. We've talked before at length about people being made in the image of God, and that is incredibly important. Because even if we don't like someone, that is a person who is important to and bears the image of God. We shouldn't praise God with our mouths and then lie and deceive our neighbors with our same words. But that can be hard. And I'm sure we can all think of a time where we've said or thought something unkind about someone else. I have. And we read that the tongue is evil and we think, well... I should hang it up now. There's no hope. But there is hope in Christ. And that's what James is getting at in verses 16 through 18. He is not saying that the tongue is evil and that we should, like, just hang it up because there's no way that we can be perfect. James offers us hope in verse 16 through 18. He tells us we should seek the wisdom of God over our own selfish desires because the wisdom that comes from Christ isn't divisive. Instead, it's full of peace and gentleness and mercy, impartiality, sincerity. And with that wisdom, we can sow peace. And so that's commandment number nine. We should not lie or deceive. Now let's move on and let's talk about commandment number 10. So commandment number 10, as it is stated here, says that we should be content, not envying anyone. But what does it mean to be content? That's a word that we kind of throw around sometimes, but it's never really fully explained. Contentment means to be in a state of peaceful happiness, to be satisfied. Commandment 10 contrasts that satisfaction with envy. So envy means to want something that someone else has. We see something, whether it's an actual possession, or maybe it's a role on a team or a station of some type of position that you hold. And we wonder why we don't have those things. We think, well, so-and-so has it. I want it too. It just isn't fair that they've got something that I don't have. And to be perfectly clear, there's nothing wrong with wanting things. It's okay to want ice cream after dinner or to maybe put a certain present on your Christmas list. What the Bible is cautioning us against here is letting those wants and desires consume you until that's the only thing that you can think about. You think, if I just had that one thing like so-and-so has over there, then I would be happy. Or you get so angry and upset that you don't have something that you let it be in your thoughts all day, every day. And even if you do get it, you find out it's not enough. There's something newer or something better or a new goal to chase. And you're just constantly looking for those things to give you validation and to give you satisfaction. That's not what contentment 
is. And that's what the Bible is cautioning us against here. So I'm going to quote um, an author and pastor and blogger for the website called The Gospel Coalition. I am probably going to mispronounce his name, and I am very sorry. So if you can help me pronounce it, I will be very appreciative. But his name is Thabiti Anuible, and he says this in his commentary on the Ninth and Tenth Commandments from the New City Catechism. So this is a commentary that you can find like on the app, or if you have the actual adult version of the book, the New City Catechism, where it goes into more detail, this is a commentary that he wrote. So he's talking to us as a pastor and a leader about what these passages of Scripture say. And so he says this about the Tenth Commandment, so about contentment and envy. He says, The Tenth Commandment sets for us a kind of boundary that protects us against the way covetous, covetousness, so wanting what we don't have, tends to cross lines. We're tempted to cross the line of desires, longing for things that aren't properly in our possession. We cross the line of property, grasping for things that belong to another person. So our coveting actually, socially, does injure our neighbor. And there's another line that we cross. He says, when we covet, what we're actually saying is that God has not apportioned his creation properly because he hasn't given everything we desire. And so the heart, in its fallen, sinful way, grasps for things that don't belong to it and seeks for things that actually belong on the other side of ownership, to the neighbor or to God. Now, this is quite a lengthy quote, but again, his commentary on these, on these two commandments are very good. If you have the app, I would encourage you to go back with a parent and look at it, because again, it's just, it's very good. But ultimately, what this quote does is it gets at the heart of the issue. And the heart is the issue. Our heart is sinful. And so we constantly reach and we look for things to give us satisfaction, whether it's the newest video game or the newest phone or the newest music or the newest set of clothes or a role on a sports team, whatever it is. We look to things that other people have to give us satisfaction. But ultimately, the Bible reminds us that true satisfaction comes from Christ. True satisfaction and contentment is resting in the things that he has given us. Again, it's okay to want things, but ultimately we shouldn't be so consumed with wanting things and wanting the newest or the next or the best or whatever that we forget who's responsible for giving us all the things that we already have and being thankful for those things. I may not have everything that my neighbor has or my best friend has or my classmates have, but God has still given me much. And that's what we should remember. We should look to God and give thanks for all that we have. James tells us in chapter 1, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so we should be content and rest in God and what he has done. And that's a good, good word for us today. So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to close this out. All right? Let's pray together. God, we just thank you for your word. Um, Lord, we thank you for this time that we've been able to, to talk about the ninth and 10th commandments. I am so incredibly thankful for all that you have taught me um, as, we've gone, as we've gone through these commandments and we've studied scripture together. Um, God, I just ask that, that you will continue to help us to remember these things um, and to live them out in our lives so that we're living in a way that brings you glory. Because, Lord, you have, you have loved us so deeply. Um, Lord, we just want to love you more deeply and to understand what your word has to say and what it has to teach us. God, I am so thankful for all of these kiddos. Um, that are watching this video and for their families. I just ask that you will be with them this time that we're apart. Um, continue to help them to learn and to grow um, and help us to remember what we've, we've already learned. God, just be with us while we're apart. Keep us safe. Keep us well. And help us be able to come back together again soon. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, gang, that is it for today. Um, so... 
again, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we are again going to be moving out of our breakdown of the Ten Commandments. Some of you guys may be a little thankful for that, um, but it's been such a good time looking at the Ten Commandments together. Again, I have learned a lot. Um, I hope you have too. And so I hope you'll tune in next week for question number 13. We're still going to be talking about the law, but next week we're going to flip the script a little bit and we're going to be talking about whether or not there's anyone who can keep the law perfectly. So I want you to be pondering that question this week. We're going to talk about it in next week's video, and I hope you'll tune in for that. In the meantime, there are other resources out there for you guys. Um, please take advantage of those. Um, if not, in the meantime, please be kind. Show the love of Jesus to your family, to your friends, to whomever you meet today. I love you very much, and I am praying for you always, and I miss you terribly. And I cannot wait to see you again soon. Have a great weekend, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.